Great. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Stefan. I'm a postdoc research at Politecnico di Milano, which is Italy's largest technical university. We have 39,000 students, so pretty large. Um, my role over there is a postdoc, which in Italy means you are a very, very temporary researcher. Um, what I'm going to talk to you, uh, what I'm going to talk about today, is uh, what is called by buzzword threat intelligence, which basically means trying to understand where the enemy wants to hit us before it hits us, which is something we have been doing with various degree of fallacy since uh, 500 years before Christ. Because this is a quote from Sun Tzu, which, you, which I will not read aloud, because everybody in this room probably already knows it. Uh, the quote which says that if you know the enemy and know yourself, you are ready for battle. If you don't know either, you will lose your battle. Uh, this is the most quoted sentence in, uh, in history, probably, and the less understood in history as well. Uh, because understanding the enemy is the key to react sensibly. And reacting sensibly is exactly what we usually fail to do. Uh, see notably counter-terrorism controls in airports. This is a notable uh, way of failing sensible reaction. So, to get down to what the Americans would call lies, then lies and statistics, in an increasing order of lies, um, this is the first quoted sentence. I actually bring this up from a, uh, from a speech from a politician. I won't name the politician. It's not an Italian politician. Italian politicians do not even understand how to spell internet, so they wouldn't <laughs> talk about the symmetric warfare. But, uh, it says, asymmetric warfare potential of cyberspace will lead to an increase in electronic warfare and cyber terrorism. True or false? God knows. Um, it's been repeated a number of times, uh, at least since 9-11, even before, actually. Um, <coughs> and one day, discussing this in a panel with Richard Power, who is the, uh, one of the editors of the Computer Security Institute, in the United States. Uh, we were discussing this in a panel, and Richard came up with this very, very cool quote that I will use with permission, which is that if we, if we ever managed to get real-world terrorists to blow up computer networks instead of blowing up skyscrapers, then we have gone a huge step forward in combating terrorism, because networks usually have backups, and skyscrapers usually don't. Which is not true, of course, it's a naive position. We all know that there are critical infrastructures that can be hit through the cyberspace. But still, what is notable here is that no one has data to either confirm or disconfirm that people are accumulating cyber warfare or cyber terrorism capabilities. We believe we, we know that people could theoretically do cyber terrorism, but we don't have any indication that they have done so so far. Uh, someone here could answer, there's data, there's actually data about this, but it's, it's classified, it's top secret. And my opinion is that it's TSBS, which stands for top secret bullshit. Um, Going ahead with the lies and then lies, uh, there's the FBI CSI report, uh, sorry Richard. Uh, there is always, in all the FBI CSI reports, since the inception of the FBI CSI report, there's a rising wave of internet crime. Somewhere in the report there's this phrase. Uh, the problem is that here, reports are based on, on the respondent's knowledge. So we are asking people, how much do you think you were hit in the last year? 
And since one of the questions is, do you have any tragic detection system and process in place? And most of the respondents say no. You can guess that I have high doubts on the uh, realism of their uh, assessment of damages, because they probably don't know how much damage they have suffered from cyber attacks. Uh, so here is a nice question, which comes from Anton Chubakin, who is a nice observer of these kind of things. Uh, if there is always a rising wave of internet cybercrime, why do average losses for incident fall every year in the last four years in the FBI CSI report? It's, there is a number of answers to this question. The real answer is, this thing is not statistically solid. Those figures are out of thin air. They have no meaning whatsoever. So, um, why, why is this true? Because the survey covers 5,000 members of the Computer Security Institute, which are not even representative of the American uh, point of view, uh, let alone of the worldwide point of view about cybercrime. And there's a response rate of 12%, so 600 out of 5,000. So you have 600 non-selected, non-statistically solid respondents out of 5,000 non-statistically solid uh, persons who have been answered the quest asking the questions. And upon this data, we build our knowledge of the enemy. And then there's my favorite quote, which has been mixed up and anonymized in order to avoid you to track down the clueless analyst who said this. But it's a number of analysts, actually, if you, if you look up in the internet. You will find a lot of sentences that run like, in July 2001, code red spreads to some huge integer of systems with even a small integer of hours, and the worldwide economic impact was estimated by someone, we don't yet know who, uh, as some insane figure of billions of dollars. And C++ was even worse than that. So, so in 2001, in 2002, everybody was saying, we'll see a greater increase of speed and of number of worms. The internet will get warmer and warmer and warmer. And uh, there were a lot of extremely good academic papers on the subject, war on worms, flash worms, whatever. Uh, nothing of this ever incarnated. We all told that the internet would get warmer. I confess that I told that the internet would get warmer. A lot of people I see in this room in their talks said that the internet would get warmer. Uh, because the trend was clear, right? Uh, there was in 2001, Code Red, Ninda, then in 2002, Slapper, then Sequel Slapper, then Blaster, then Sasser, and then nothing more. I have an IMFS t-shirt which has all these uh, events on the back, like the uh, concert dates of rock bands. So, I, I know that we all thought that there would be more dates. We even braced collectively for impact on a couple of vulnerabilities during the last years, because we said, oh my god, here it comes. It didn't come. So, uh, is, is it just that we got better at defending networks. No, we didn't. What happened was that people figured out that infecting computers was less funny than infecting them and then selling the machine that you infected. Because that generates money. So, we have a lot of boats around. Uh, when I was young, ages ago, uh, the boats were things you used on the IRC if you were a loser and you had a lot of time to, to waste. You used bots to control IRC channels and to wage wars over IRC. Um, don't ask what you remember. Uh, we used to call the remote control Trojans zombies. Um, we didn't call them bots. Today bots and zombies have merged and they are different. They have a lot of intelligent features they have complex command and control infrastructures. There's 
people who specialize in actually hunting down these types of botnets because it's very difficult to do. So, tracking and understanding how these botnets work and more how and why they are operated is a difficult research problem. It's not easy. You can do that manually if you are a very, very good botnet answer, but we would prefer something more automatic than you know, just resorting to get the Efron or someone of the same kind every time we need to track down a botnet. Um, another question, which is still open, for instance, why is, not, why is no one ever targeted the infrastructure with the possible exception of Witty? Uh, well, the usual explanation was because it's more difficult to infect a, and, and to propagate a worm across routers than it is to propagate a worm across usual uh, hardware and, uh, and, and software. This is not really true anymore. There's a lot of ways to run code on board of core infrastructure <coughs> elements. Or you can simply use a traditional worm as the propagation vector and then a destructive payload against the, uh, against the routers and there were a couple of windows of opportunity during uh, June 2003 when Blasty was propagating there was also a Cisco IOS vulnerability which could be targeted and during April 2004 when there was Sasser propagating there was another Cisco vulnerability at the same time so why the, the slash bin slash ladies of the world, of the cyber world were not targeting, grinning and reaping our routers Either there are no slash bin slash latest, which is ideally unlikely, or they have better agendas than to tear down the internet infrastructures, because the internet is a giant money generating, money laundering machine, which is very useful to good guys and bad guys as well. So maybe the infrastructure is not at stake. Um, so, summary, we don't know the enemy. We don't actually understand why they are, what they are targeting and why they are targeting us. And the result is that every battle is a certain risk, in the word of, uh, of Sun Tzu. Oh, by the way, I, I will be jumping through a couple of, of the slides, which are less important than the others, because this talk is told for a longer time slot than I have, so don't worry if you see me jumping through, it's just something totally unimportant, which I filled in to fill a longer, a longer slot. You will get just the, the important parts of the talk. Uh, <clears throat> a great misconception is that observing attacks is equal to knowing attackers. There's a lot of projects that try to demonstrate that they are uh, profiling or understanding attackers just looking at what they do. It's not like that. Uh, for one, profiling is an uncertain affair at best and even good profilers of real criminal cases will tell you that it's more a matter of sound perception and some intelligent tricks than a matter of really getting a profile from the crime scene. Uh, in the digital world, it's even more difficult to actually profile attackers based on what they do. Uh, your common run-of-the-mill script kitty and your uh, black hacker with a lot of money and a lot of knowledge, of course, would behave differently. But actually, they might do a couple of the same thing during a more elaborate attack. For instance, a very good, uh, skilled attacker could perform a lame attack against the target network just to create uh, a jumping point and to leave people uh, in the, uh, to leave to people the perception that he is a lame attacker, while he is not. So, you cannot really look at that lame attack and, and draw the conclusion that he's a lame attacker. Um, the need to understand not what attackers do, so how many machines they penetrate or how many bots they spread, but what they do and why they want to do that, is felt also at political levels. For instance, there's a new commissioner, Vivian Reading, which is the Commissioner for Communications and uh, Infrastructure of, of Telecommunications. 
who recently stressed that it's difficult for decision makers, namely her, to understand what to do about cybercrime, namely what we want to fight, probably, uh, because there are no models of what the attackers want to do. Because if you want to actually fight crime, and not simply to put people in jail, you have to create policies or create laws that actually deter the crime. Because if you simply say, well, if you break into a computer, or if you own some types of hacking tools in some cases, uh, you may end up in jail. Well, that's of course an approach to the problem. You broke the law, you end up in jail. But is this enough to combat the real problem caused by cyber attackers, by real cyber attackers? Probably not. Probably the way to deter some types of cyber attacks has more to do with trying to understand how they are going, for instance, to uh, launder the money get got, they got from, uh, you know, renting a botnet, than having to do with disinfecting the botnet itself. If you can cut off the money, or if you can make it more difficult to create money out of such an attack, you will deter the attacker, instead of just putting in jail some guys that probably don't have anything to do with that. Um, and this is testimony also in the United States by a number of different investments of the De Department of Homeland Security that don't really attract our attention as European, mostly Europeans. I, I, are, are there any Americans in this room? Okay, happy Thanksgiving, anyone? Uh, because we, we, we carefully chose the dates of, of this conference to be coincident with Thanksgiving. We are sorry, guys. Um, today, there's a number of observation points for cybercrime. They're all good efforts, I repeat it, because I got named for a, a similar run of this talk before. They're, they are all excellent activities. What I will do right now is just to, to look at them, see what's good with them, and see what are the lacking points, which are not lacking in a negative way, they are just not there. Okay. So, first one is Atlas. Atlas is, a, a, is an excellent job by Arbor Networks. Arbor claims that it monitors more than 70% of the routed address space on the internet because their products is, are used by carriers. Uh, so, of course, this is debatable because it's difficult to say where you are monitoring what. But still, it's a good observation point, without doubt. Uh, basically, Atlas uses the unit, they are used address spaces as darkness. So, a darknet is a large portion of the, of, the, of the address space which is routed, which is reachable, but which is not used, so you shouldn't see any traffic going there. Um, there's a public portal, which is atlas.arbor.net, and they use geolocation of attacks, they have the usual top of sources, top exploits, stuff running around, and they also aggregate some data from different sources because their platforms cannot alone generate uh, data, for instance, capturing attacks, actually. Because if you use a darknet, that's not reachable, so the attacker will just send a packet and then you will not get uh, a packet back. So uh, basically you will see the, the backscatter of attacks, basically, but not the attacks themselves. So you need also honeypots, you need also other types of logs in order to understand what's happening. And there's a group of people, the desert of uh, Arbor, who is analyzing data. The problem, it's not the problem actually, it's, it's their business, is to use this data to push updates to their customers. So if you are a customer of Arbor, you get access to the whole of the data, to the analysis and so on and so forth. If you're not a customer, you get interesting write-ups on uh, the Acer blog, but you don't get the real data, so this is normal. It's, it's something done by a company, so it's, it's got to be uh, business-oriented. The same goes for DeepSight. DeepSight is Symantec's uh, threat management system, 
which basically aggregates all the records from the Symantec sources and firewall logs, uh, IDS logs that they have in their managed services around the world. Um, and if you aggregate also the logs from antivirus clients and so on and so forth, this amounts to more than 100 million clients around. Uh, it's a huge set of data, uh, which, of course, provided to Symantec Labs the capability of analyzing the threats. Problem is, once again, their business model is to provide this information to their paying customer. It's not information for the public or for the research community, unless they get to do a write-up afterwards. But having been working with them, it's more things that they keep proprietary inside. They don't usually publish them. Uh, if not in a very, very aggregate form, which is not really useful to researchers. I mean, once again, it's, it's not strange, it's, it's their business to do so. so. <laughs> other statistics are usually made up by other vendors, uh, which is summed up by the Dilbert strip over there. Dilbert is the source of all of the wisdom in this way. Uh, what happens if you add the lies from marketing to the boss assumption and then the factory reality explosion, stupid reality. And this is the title of a real uh, free letter vendor, huge free letter vendor report. Uh, searching viruses and worms targeting mobile devices and satellite communications anticipated in 2005. Hello, it's the end of 2007. Where are those satellite communications worms yet? They are not here. So basically, there's something wrong with these assumptions. Then there's the, the community efforts. First one, Internet Search Center. When you have something which shows up on the screens and you don't know what it is, usually the first place you hit for information is the Internet Search Center. It's managed by, which is managed by SANS. It uses DSHIELD, which is a distributed project for collecting raw logs of intrusion detection systems, firewalls, and so on and so forth. It analyzes tens of millions of log entries each day, and it has a lot of voluntary incident handlers, uh, which are very experienced guys, most known in, in the information security circles, who add value to all this data which comes out. Arguably, the Internet Storm Center is as good as an effort <coughs> that we have managed to make until now as a community. It's the best effort that we have made. And of course, the data from the uh, ISC has a huge early warning potential. The handlers are able to see a threat before the threat has been identified. But the problem is that they are not usually able to see the threat with enough time ahead to be able to actually counteract this threat. And it's, it's, just, it's just because the handlers, you know, the handlers are humans, with some exception applying, but the ISC handlers are just humans. So, uh, The problem here, uh, I, I have listed on these slides uh, a number of other initiatives that I don't have time to get into. They're all interesting. The Kai, the network telescopes, the internet motion sensors uh, by University of Michigan. They are all uh, more or less the same stuff. So based on the idea of darkness or of, you know, uh, analyzing routed but not really used networks in order to gather some data <laughs> on what's happening of, of, on the internet. The limitation of all of these initiatives is that because of, basically because of privacy issues, data that is gathered for, by the Internet Search Center, for instance, cannot be shared. And this is obvious, because some of this data could contain sensitive information. And people share data with the ISC because they trust the handlers and they trust SENSE with this data. But they wouldn't trust SENSE anymore if this data got published as a blog. Uh, so what you get from these types of efforts is usually just basic statistics 
about global current threats. So attackers are attacking this port, which may indicate that a new exploit is running around. It's a great service. It's excellent. Uh, the problem is that, for instance, in the case of, uh, of SANS uh, and ISC, the source is not controlled. So basically, you could have someone inserting willingly false positives inside the data set. Uh, this is not usually a problem because there's such a huge user base that the false positive voluntarily inserted uh, will get basically tuned out by the fact that no one else is seeing the same things. Um, and as I was saying, uh, endless are humans with possible exceptions in the direction of demigod, but while skilled, this is a limitation for early warning capabilities because they can, act, they can analyze the events after the events took place. So something more automated would be, would be needed for real early warning. And the second problem, the real problem with this approach, is that the data they are collecting is lacking. In the sense that if you look at the ISC blog, well, something that you probably routinely do, uh, many times you see the anglers asking for submission of packet dumps or for submission of catches of malware because they can't actually capture the malware. They just see the traces in the logs and then they have to ask people to voluntarily submit the malware, which is kind of a complication. Uh, and it leads to problems such as what happened on July the 4th this year, uh, when people noticed that there was obs uh, an oscillation of some kind uh, in a deviation of global network traffic with different packet losses and time, to, uh, and time to reach various points of the internet. And they noticed also a geographical distribution of, of, the, of this pattern of activity. Uh, I didn't insert the name of the researchers because I don't intend to bash the researchers. They noticed something and they alerted us that they noticed something. They did the right thing from their point of view. So I don't, I don't want to bash them with you know, an a posteriori review of what they've seen. Uh, at the same time, they noticed on the shield, on, on the ISC, that there was a spy on port 5901, which is the NC port, and since there was an exploit supposedly targeting VLC distributed earlier, they made basic maps. There's a spike, there was an exploit, there's a, a deviation in normal traffic balance in some regions. There's a leaking group in some regions which is attacking the regions using a new exploit on a vulnerability on VLC port. It's totally understandable. The only problem is that the exploit was against a VLC ActiveX control so basically it was a client-based exploit, not a server-based exploit. Uh, ISC analyzed the spike on the VNC port and found it to be just a deviation, a statistical deviation with no real meaning. Jose Nazario used Atlas data, showed that the correlation between the VNC attacks and loss of connectivity or reported loss of connectivity was, not, was just not there. There was no time correlation was just, you know, something happening more or less at the same time, but there was no significant correlation between the two. So, we still don't know what happened or what didn't happen at that time, but we definitely know that the explanation of VNC correlation was wrong. Nothing bad here, but what if we somehow reacted to that? What if we somehow created a reaction for that thing? What if we told that it was a worm propagating, we maybe shut down VNC connectivity at border gateway level, such as the providers did during the various Sasser or Slammer wars? We would have disrupted significantly the ability of people to control machines remotely for nothing. So, what's the problem here? Uh, it's that we actually, what we need, is data that can just come from honeypots. So data which actually captures what's happening, not just the ports where something, ha something is happening. 
And the successful project here is Project Honeynet. Project Honeynet is a great project, once again. Lance Pitner created something which is really huge. There's a lot of people around the world working with Honeypot, gaining insights from Honeypot, collecting things, understanding. The problem is that Honeypots usually are more useful is that if they are high interaction Honeypots. But if you want to extract data from a high interaction Honeypot which has been violated, you need to take it offline, perform forensics analysis, do a write-up, post the write-up. Which means it takes time, it takes effort, it takes skill. And the project on it builds things out of this because they have times, a little time, a lot of skills, people working on that. But what we would need actually is something similar to Project Honeynet and ISC combined. Something which is a network of polypods, of high interaction polypods possibly, which can be actually automatically analyzed and correlated. How do you build such a thing? We have a few building blocks. I will not go through each of these because I don't have the time and because probably most of you know most of these tools and we'll just launch to you the names and the definitions so that if there's something that catches your attention and you didn't know, you can look it up with your own Google later. HoneyD, everybody knows HoneyD, way to generate low interaction animals. Great stuff, great things, two problems. One is you have to generate scripts for interaction and you have to generate good scripts if you want to capture real attacker's activity. And generating a script is a tedious task. And for this, guys, in, uh, some guys in France, generate a thing that is called ScriptGen. ScriptGen is an auto-generator of scripts that emulate a service, which would be a reverse engineer web dream if it, if it worked actually. It doesn't work completely, it works well enough to generate the scripts for capturing some specific types of exploits. Because when you actually run an exploit, you don't really want to have the full set of, of a service available. You just want some specific subsets. So, um, basically what happens with script, with a uh, honey farm with script is that when a machine with honey D doesn't know how to answer a specific query, it forwards the query to a high interaction honeypot, which afterwards will get analyzed and all the usual stuff. And in this process, it will automatically generate a script for answering subsequent queries similar to that one. Um, there's a similar effort which is on it. I don't know it. I, I know scripts and better. I, I suppose they are more or less the same thing from, from my group. Then there are successful efforts. Uh, Nepentas and MW Collect, uh, I don't really need to talk about this, there's Georg Vikersky, which is here somewhere, and he will talk about it tomorrow, or, or, or today, I think tomorrow actually, so just go and ask Georg, why do you ask me, you wrote this stuff. But basically, the idea here is to collect the malware, which is sent as a payload of an attack, to store it, to download it, and and what? To analyze it, probably. But the problem is that if you run this stuff on a large scale, as the guys from the Panthers are doing, you end up with a huge amount of malware, which then you need to analyze somehow. And you need probably to analyze it automatically if you want to get any useful data out of it. Then there's another stuff which maybe you no less, because it's not as much practical as it's academic, which is Argos. It's a way to build high interaction honeypots. Basically, it's a way to modify QM in order to run virtual machines of honeypots uh, and use state analysis, which means, which is a very difficult word for a very simple concept. If you see something running through the network and later you see the same something running inside the memory of the computer, then something very bad has happened. If some code, if you're executing some code which came from the network, then something bad has happened. Which doesn't actually catch 99.9% .9 of the exploits, but it catches 99.8% of them. 
Um, and the sweet thing here is that because you are modifying the virtual machine running the code, you can actually run every type of operating system inside and just get the same result. Uh, there's a project called Levercom, which maybe you don't know, uh, which is operated by Eurecom, uh, which is an institute in Sofia Antipoli. Levercom is a network of Onipods, covers more than 30 countries, and uses Onipods created with ScriptZen and HolyD in order to analyze the most interactions possible. You can go to levercom.org and see for yourself. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to get into the details. There's a lot of other projects that I mentioned here, but I will jump through. <clears throat> and arrive to the project that I wanted to introduce to you, which is called Wombat. The Wombat is that awful animal over there. I didn't know it was so awful, or I would have fight against the naming of the project. Uh, actually, seeing it alive in Australia is even more awful than that. So it's better to use this, this square sign and not, and not the real photograph of, of the beast. Uh, it means worldwide obs observatory of uh, malicious behavior and attack tools. Basically, it's an idea, it's a research project which has been funded by the EU uh, and by partner countries and will be starting at the beginning of 2008 with among the participants your Technical University of Vienna, uh, the Freie University in Amsterdam, my own university of course, otherwise why would I be here? Um, some research institutes around the world, a certain corporations, a couple of, uh, a, a large security vendor which doesn't want to be named yet, and a large internet service provider which similarly doesn't want to be named yet. Um, the large internet service provider has a name which includes a name of a European country inside, so you know there's a, just a handful that you can, that you can choose from. Uh, and the large security vendor is really large. And then there's a highly innovative SME which has no issue whatsoever in being named. It's Isposec, which is the company which runs VirusTotal.com. So uh, you, you can see why they would be interested in something like the idea here is to target data acquisition, so try to develop what I described to you earlier as a network of high interaction on um, which will be substantially based upon um, Argos and ScriptZen and OniD, um, but also on new types of polymorphs that this project do not yet incorporate. Basically, the two types of polymorphs that we think that need to be developed. Some, some efforts are already being done in the area, but uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Our client-based polymorphs, and in particular, not just developing a client-based polymorph, which is not so difficult or so unresolved, but how to integrate a client-based polymorph inside a network of polymorphs such as the one that we are building. And uh, the second idea is to build wireless and Bluetooth polymorphs, which have a very difficult problem of needing to be geographically dispersed around the country, which is not so easy to solve. Um, of course, here the idea is that this project is the last comer on the block. We don't want to arrive and say, hey, we are going to solve everybody's problems. Uh, what we want to do here is to try to have collaboration with the other projects that are already collecting data. We have, you know, we have uh, gathered some support from the EU for improving collaboration. So we are all for improving this. And we will have, uh, and we, we will hold a workshop actually uh, in the early 2008 for all those people and structures that are interested or potentially interested in sharing data or getting access to this data because we want to create a standard for collaboration. So, if you are interested or if you think you are interested, please feel free to get in touch with me because it will not be a call for paper open workshop, it will be an invitation based workshop, but we surely want to invite everybody who is interested in this. Um, Once you have acquired a lot of data, and there's a lot of people who have acquired data, you have the problem of how to analyze it, which is basically uh, the idea that uh, 
Collecting thousands of malware is easy. Actually, it's, it's more than enough to put a clueless Windows user with a clueless Windows machine out there, and you will collect thousands of malware very easily. Then we have the problem of identifying them, of automatically or automatically classifying them, which is more difficult. And the priceless thing would be to be able to figure out who has developed them and why they have developed them, which is the end result that we, we aim to, to get with this project. Uh, some of the examples of uh, technologies that are already there that can be incorporated in this is code behavior characterization, the idea of analyzing the structure of code, of code constructing phylogeny. Uh, you can ask um, uh, Howard Flake, who is giving a talk tomorrow, not today, uh, about this specific topic. Um, and also, all the contextual information of attacks, that basically are all the information that today you already collect with ISC or other types of, uh, of efforts. So, how the attack was performed, types of scanning activities that preceded the attack, the type of deployed payload, which is something that you can do with MW Collect even today, subsequent actions of the attacker. All this data can be used and should be used to automatically characterize and classify the attacks. Uh, doing threat analysis upon this data will be actually doable because up, um, until now you don't have data sets where you can do threat analysis on. And it would be difficult, not in the usual economic or time spent sense of the word, but it's difficult in the academic research stuff sense of the word. So you can see that probably what the academic partners of the project are more interested in is this part. What the infrastructure vendors part are more interested in is the uh, previous part. The idea here, what we want to deliver, and we will try to, to be able to do that by, well, actually 2010, because this is a three years project, is to deliver early warning capabilities, which is simpler, and trying to deliver reports, high level reports, on what actually the people are doing with this stuff. <coughs> which is, if you remember, exactly the first question that I asked during my talk. And so, this is basically a, a set of milestones, the roadmap of the project, uh, which is in early 2008, the invitation workshop that I told you about. Uh, in late 2008 and beginning of 2009, deployment of sensors. By, the, by 2009, we will end the characterization phase, and in early 2010, or somewhere in 2010, uh, we will have probably, likely, perhaps, an early warning prototype and root cause analysis stuff developed. Um, this is a joint industrial and academic project, which means there will be a lot of academic publications in it and a lot of stuff which will be developed by industrial partners and then, of course, industrial partners will decide how to release it. The data sets, or a subset of the data sets, are meant to be released to research in some ways or the other. So one of the key points in, the, in this workshop that I was talking about is actually understanding what we will be able to, uh, to deliver to researchers and what researchers want us to deliver to them. Yeah, okay. I, I finished. This is my conclusions. So, basically, uh, what I want to do, to, what I want from you right now is if you are interested in trying to join this workshop because you, you have a, an interest at stake in, in this type of stuff, please feel free to contact me. I cannot promise that you will be part of the workshop, but I can promise that we want everybody who is really interested to have in there because it's very important for us. Second thing that I want you to do is if you have, you know, perceptions or ideas on this stuff, or if you think that I forgot something in my analysis of what is there right now, if you, for instance, think that there's something out there right now that you believe already responds to some of my questions, 
please let me know, because we don't want to ignore it. <laughs> we really want to integrate our approach with what is already existing out there. And in the end, if you have any feedback, which can be also insults, curses, or whatever, I already received my own share after disclosing this last during the summer, so pretty used to it. Please feel free to contact me at my email address, which is over there. It's, uh, it's my surname at elbt.polymi.it. And my website is over there. There's not a lot of information around the Wombat yet, because of course it will start in January, so the website and everything will be up in January or shortly thereafter. But if you want more information, and I, if I can share that with you, you are more than welcome to ask. And you're more than welcome to ask now and now as well.